Today we commemorated the death day of Rinzai, Esho Gigen Zenzi Dai Osho, who we know died in the year 866. Quite some time ago, in a different place, not in America, not in Japan, but in China. So it's been a long way since then. And still this tradition in which we operate here, these forms are named Rinzai Zen. And today in a you're lucky, fairly short talk, I'll try to explore what that actually means. Because there are some misconceptions that come up, not because we are stupid, but because we are human and because we use words. We use words not only in English, but in all languages that are spoken languages. Did you have a chance to look at the board and see the portrait of Rinzai under the Teisho thing? Anyone? Okay. Yeah. That's a painting of Rinzai. He's showing his teeth. Some words, not in a very uh, inviting way. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh yeah, this is an ancestor commemoration ceremony. Usually we do teatsu, which is the shaving. And then I looked at Rinzai and said, oh no. No, this Rinzai here needs to be commemorated in the way that he presented himself to this world as well. Unshaven. Putting forth the Zen that he had learned from his teacher, O Baku Kion. Sometimes it's called Bo Katsu. Bo is the stick, and Katsu is ah! the shout. Shout and hitting. That's what everybody thinks about Rinzai. And it is inscribed this painting that is hanging there, and we'll leave it up so you can go and let's see what you think of Rinzai after this. And it was inscribed by Ikkyu Sojun, much, much later, a Japanese Rinzai descendant. Ikkyu is probably most well known by his poems, uh, Crow with No Mouth, for example. I will not go into that today. But here is what Ikkyo wrote about Rinzai in this poem that is written on the picture that hangs there. Shout for shout. Shout for shout for shout. That instantly tells us if it's life or death. Wicked evil, his ogre eyeballs bright, bright as any sun or moon. That's his description of Rinzai. But when we look into it, it becomes even more interesting. How did Rinzai become Rinzai? He was a monk too. And he studied with, anyone remember? Obaku Kiyun, right? Huang Po. So the first entry in the record of pilgrimages of the Rinzai Roku, the record of Rinzai reads like this. When Rinzai was one of the assembly of monks, 
an der Obakukion. He was plain and direct in his behavior. The head monk praised him, saying, Though he's a youngster, he's different from the other monks. And this head monk's name was Bokushu. Bokushu asked Rinzai, oh, How long have you been here? Three years, replied Rinzai. Have you ever asked for instruction? No, I have never asked for instruction. I don't know what to ask. And Bokushu, in his kindness, said to Rinzai, Why don't you go in and ask the, the master of this temple just what the cardinal principle of the Buddha Dharma is? Rinzai, clearly a little bit maybe naive, <laughs> went ahead into the room of Obaku and asked. Before he even had finished speaking, <laughs> he was already hit. Rinzai came back out. He happened to pass by Bokushu. Bokushu asked, how did your question go? <laughs> Before I had finished speaking, the master hit me. I don't understand, said Rinzai. Again, very kind Bokushu said, then go and ask again. So Rinzai went back and asked, and again, just as before, Obaku hit him. Overall, Rinzai asked the same question three times, and he was hit three times. He looked for Bokushu and came back to him and said to him, it was so kind of you to send me to question the master. Three times I honestly asked him, and three times I was hit by him. I regret that some obstruction caused by my own past karma prevents me from grasping his profound meaning. I'm going away for a while. He didn't say, what's wrong with you? You set me up. You knew exactly what will happen. He did not say, what's up with that old fart? He doesn't say anything. He just hits me even before I ask. But he says, I don't, I don't understand, I can't grasp it. But he attributed it to himself, being unable to do it. And said, well, I'll go away a little while and uh, maybe there's somewhere, some a person that will help me and explain it to me. So Bokushu said, uh, well, if you're going away, you should go and say goodbye to your master. And Inzai bowed low and went to his chambers. Very quickly, in the meanwhile, the head monk Bokushu went to Obaku's quarters before Rinzai arrived and said to Obaku, the young man who has been questioning you is a man of Dharma. If he comes to take his leave, please handle him expediently. In the future, I am certain, with training, 
he is sure to become a great tree which will provide cool shade for the people of the world. Obaku listened. Obaku and Bokushu were very honest to each other. So that trust that existed made Obaku not question what was relayed to him. Rinzai appeared to take his leave. Obaku, now speaking his first words to Rinzai, said, You mustn't go anywhere else but to Daigu. Go to Daigu's place. He's sure to explain things for you. Rinzai took his leave and went to Daigu. At Daigu's temple, he arrived. And Daigu, of course, like every Zen master at the time, asks, Where have you come from? I have come from Obaku's place, replied Rinzai. Oh, what did Obaku have to say? Asked Daigu. You know, this is like, like the mafia. <laughs> All the capos do respect each other and do not dare to tread in somebody else's territory. And Rinzai said, well, three times I asked Obaku just what the cardinal principle of the Buddha Dharma was. And three times he hit me. I don't know whether I was at fault or not. Shaking his head, Daigu said, Obaku is such a grandmother that he utterly exhausted himself with your troubles. And now you come here asking whether you were at fault or not. At these words, Rinzai had a deep awakening. <sighs> After all, there isn't so much to Obaku's Buddha Dharma, he said. Daigu grabbed him and said, You bedwetting little devil! You just finished asking whether you were at fault or not, and now you say, Oh, Obaku's Buddha Dharma, there's really not much to it. What did you just see? Speak! Speak! Rinzai, without any hesitation, bing, ding, jabbed Daigu three times in the side. Shoving him away, Daigu said to him, You have Opaku as a teacher. This is none of my business. <laughs> Get out of here and send him back. Rinzai left Daigu and returned to Obaku. Obaku saw him coming and said, Ah, oh, what a fellow! Coming and going, coming and going. When will it end? Rinzai replied, It is all due to your grandmotherly kindness. Gave his cust the customary gift and stood waiting. Where have you been? asked Obaku. Recently you deigned to favor me by sending me to see Daigu, said Rinzai. What did Daigu have to say? asked Obaku. Rinzai just recounted what happened, and Obaku said, how I'd like to catch that fellow and give him a good dose of my stick. Mafia. 
<laughs> Kneecaps. Why say, I would like to? Take it right now, said Rinzai, and slapped his teacher. <laughs> you lunatic, goes Obaku, coming back here and pulling the tiger's whiskers. Lin, uh, uh, Rinzai went, ah! Upon which Obaku called the attendant and said, get this lunatic out of here and take him to the Zendo. This is how Rinzai and Obaku became very, very close. <laughs> Not only physical, <laughs> but it is this story is, is wonderful because we all arrive at this practice and inevitably, in that top 10, what is being played on that channel of self-doubt is, I don't get it. I don't get it. I think you know that song. I don't get it. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> From that, he moved in an instant by being exposed to another teacher who gave just, shown the light onto himself from a little different angle and was able to relate to that grandmotherly kindness. Joshu Roshi was a true Rinzai teacher. That is my ordination teacher. He came to the United States in 1962. And he brought that Rinzai method here. And he started seeing students. It was very, very humble. And the interesting thing is the connection with Daibosatsu Zendo, Soen Roshi, and the whole Rinzai tradition in America is there are many, many connections. One of them is that he, Joshua Roshi, came to Los Angeles four years after Nyogen Senzaki had passed away. So some of the Sangha who studied with uh, Senzaki Sensei came and continued to study with Joshua Roshi. There is a picture of Joshua Roshi's first abode where he stayed, which uh, was in Gardena. There, where they made a stone garden. Joshua Roshi made a stone garden. He went up into the mountains and got these big bowlers and made a real Japanese stone garden in this residential neighborhood in Gardena. And there's the picture of Joshua Roshi standing in next to him, sitting on a chair in a nice Western suit with a handbag covering her legs. It's Shubin Tanahashi. Shubin Tanahashi, who was so generous to at Nyogen Senzaki. It was a difficult time at that time, bringing Rinzai Zen here. Joshu Roshi came and they brought him, it was a dentist who was involved in bringing him here, Dr. Harmon. Maybe he wasn't a dentist. Shukusan, am I wrong? <laughs> he was not a dentist, but he was a doctor. And so he dropped them off in his practice, which was on the weekend. And of course, finally, this Dr. Harmon realized after some time Sunday afternoon, oh, damn, there is no food there. Joshu Roshi should have some food. So he went there, and all he brought was a loaf of wonder bread. And Joshu Roshi received it very graciously, thank you. And he started eating it. And he recounted to us that, well, I started eating the bread. And then within half an hour, I prepared to die. <laughs> <laughs> it's not <laughs> advisable for somebody who comes from Japan to start feasting on wonder bread. And we don't know what was in, in the 1960s either. 
but he was a real Rinzai man. He used to hit his students. And how? In the beginning. But then suddenly, maybe 1964, 1965, he stopped hitting the students. And so one of his students started to ask him, Roshi, Joshi, Roshi, why? Why, why, why are you giving up on that Rinzai method of hitting people? And Joshi Roshi said, oh, very easy. And he put up his fist and said, my fist, American fist. <laughs> <laughs> and he had learned never to hit somebody whose fists are bigger than your own. So that method was lost there. I don't know about Edo Roshi if he used to hit people. Yes. Yes? Very yes. Well. <laughs> Very well. And then at some point, it's always once it becomes institutionalized, the law comes in <laughs> and the fear of liability and so on. So hitting somebody is not something that is uh, recommended by any organization. <laughs> and it is not necessary, necessarily, you know. It's just a challenge for us to find a different way. And that also leads me to this, what is it that Rinzai became? What do you think it is that Rinzai became? We know what Rinzai became by seeing how he, and reading how he taught. So here in the, in the discourses, Rinzai says, this world is not a place where you remain for long. The death-dealing demon impermanence comes in an instant without discriminating between noble and base, old and young. If you wish to differ in no way from the ancestral Buddha, just don't seek outside. The pure light in your single thought that is the Dharmakaya Buddha within your own house. The non-discriminating light in your single thought. This is the Sambhogakaya Buddha within your own house. The non-differentiating light in your single thought. This is the Nirmanakaya Buddha within your own house. This threefold body of the Buddha is you. Listening to my discourse right now before my very eyes. Only because there is no running around seeking outside are there such meritorious activities. Please notice your mind. Is it asking, what is the Dharmakaya Buddha? Wow, let me remember what the Sambhogakaya means and what the Nirmanakaya means. And Rinzai has an answer for that. According to the masters of the sutras and shastras, the threefold body is regarded as the ultimate teaching. But in my view, this is not so. This threefold body is merely a name. Moreover, it is a threefold dependency. A sage of old said, the Buddha bodies are posited depending upon meaning. 
the Buddha lands are postulated in keeping with substance. Rinzai continues, therefore, we clearly know that dharma-natured bodies and dharma-natured lands are no more than reflections, delusions. Virtuous monks, followers of the way, you must recognize the one who manipulates these reflections. That person is the primal source of all the Buddhas and every place in the home to which this follower of the way returns. This physical body of yours is composed of the four great elements. None of them can neither expound the Dharma nor listen to it. Your spleen and your stomach your liver and gallbladder can neither expound the Dharma nor listen to it. The empty sky can neither expound the Dharma nor listen to it. Then just what can expound the Dharma and listen to it? What is that? This very you, standing distinctly before me without any form, shining alone, this can expound the Dharma and listen to it. Understand it this way, and you are not different from the ancestral Buddha. Just never ever be interrupted, and all that contacts your eyes will be right. But because when feeling arises, wisdom is barred, and when thinking changes, the substance varies, therefore, Humans transmigrate through the three realms and undergo all kinds of suffering. As I see it, there are none who are not of the utmost profundity, none who aren't emancipated. There is nothing about hitting in here. There is no shouting in here. Maybe he inherited the grandmotherly kindness of his teacher, Obaku. But what he talks about is very clear. The true person of the way is never confused. Merely according with circumstances and conditions as they are, that person makes use of their past karma. Accepting things as they come, that person puts on their clothes. When that person wants to walk, they walk. When they want to sit, they sit. They never have a single thought of seeking Buddhahood. Why is this so? A sage of old said, if you create karma trying to seek Buddha, Buddha will become a great precursor of birth and death. Followers of the way, time is precious, yet you try by running hither and thither to learn meditation, to study the way, to accept names, to accept phrases, to seek Buddha, to seek an ancestor, to seek a good teacher, and try to speculate. Make no mistake. After all, you do have a father and a mother. What more would you seek? Try turning your own light inward upon yourselves. This is all very clear, very unadorned. What is Rinzai asking us to become? 
that what Obaku had asked him to become. He became Rinzai. We must become Isaac. We must become Gangyo, Seikai, Gesha, Shoyo, Shuko, Hanjing, John, Dan, everybody, every single one of us is called to become themselves fully. If you want to freely live or die, go or stay, to take off or put on your clothes, then right now recognize the person who is listening. This person is without form, without characteristics, without root, without source, without any dwelling place, yet is brisk and lively. Ask for all their manifold responsive activities. The place where they are carried on is, in fact, no place. Therefore, when you look for that person, they retreat farther and farther. When you seek that person, they turn more and more the other way. This is called the mystery. And as long as we mysteriously grasp after reaching that, we are just moving the opposite way. It was Rinzai's time and chosen way to yell a lot and to hit people. And sometimes in this Rinzai tradition, we might believe that we have to do the same thing. But none of us, in fact, no person can become Rinzai and hit and shout the way Rinzai did it. But we can learn to smile the way that comes in the same way that Rinzai was handing out his blows. That we can gently thank somebody with the same intensity as Rinzai's shout. And so you don't, that I, I will tell you one more story. And that is just so we don't feel too bad. Rinzai didn't have it e easy either, you know? He had students and colleagues that we would call peculiar individuals. And one of them was by the name of Fuke. One day when the master and Fuke were both attending a dinner at a patron's house, the master asked, a hare swallows up the great sea and a mustard seed contains Mount Sumeru. Is this the marvelous activity of supernatural power or original substance as it is? Fuke turned over the dinner table. How coarse, exclaimed the master. Fuke replied, what place do you think this is, talking about coarse and fine? The next the two went out again to a dinner. This time the master asked, how does today's feast compare with yesterday's? <laughs> he turned over the table again. Good enough, said Rinzai to Fuke. How coarse. <laughs> Blind man, said Fuke. What is Buddha Dharma 
What does it have to do with coarse and fine? The master stuck out his tongue. I am not admonishing you to turn over tables when you're invited to dinner, but to taste the freshness and the liveliness that the Rinzai tradition wants to instill in its follower is such a terrible word. Don't follow anything. In each individual, in our wonderful diverse nature, you know? In our, it's an individuality, but not as a static thing, but just as a unique set of conditions that makes each of us arise. Now, this Fouquet, he was quite, quite someone. Let's see. You will meet odd fellows in this practice. One day Fouquet went out about the streets asking people to give him a one-piece gown. Give me a one-piece gown. And since he was a monk, many people offered him a one-piece gown. These robes that we have on are one-piece gowns. Rinzai called the Fus of the temple, which is the financial administra administrator of the temple, and instructed him to buy a coffin. And when Fuke came back, the master said, I've gotten you a one-piece gown. Fouquet put the coffin on his shoulders and went around the streets shouting, Look, look, Rinzai fixed me up with this one-piece gown. I'm going to the East Gate to depart this life. Everyone scrambled after him to watch. As he came to the East Gate, he put the coffin down, sat on it and said, ah, no, not today, but tomorrow I'll go to the South Gate and I will die there. After he had repeated the same thing <laughs> for three days, nobody believed him anymore. On the fourth day, not a single person followed him to watch. He went outside the town walls all by himself, carrying his one-piece gown, put it on, lied down in the coffin, and asked a passerby, would you mind nailing the lid shut? As that stranger came into town and the news immediately spread, all townspeople scrambled on opening the coffin. They saw he had vanished, body and all. Only the sound of his bell could be heard in the sky, receding away. Ding! 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 Let us disappear like Fouquet into the empty sky that does not have any need to expound the Dharma, that has no need for anything about. Let us follow the way of 
Rin Sai Esho Gigen, who demonstrated how one becomes completely emancipated and how one is able to vigorously live in this world. Rinzai practice is a practice that asks us mostly one thing, be alive. And for being alive, what is the first requirement? You must show up right here and now. I kind of have a guess what Rinzai would say. <laughs>